For many, 1947 was a pivotal point in history. But what if the real pivot point was 780,000 years before that? Why is the Australite tektite at the center of a mystery? There is an asteroid bombardment. There is no crater. A large craft had been destroyed in space. Such conclusive evidence. NASA scientists went to great troubles to see if they could replicate this. Homo sapiens are genetically engineered, diverged 780,000 years ago. How do we come about? What is a human? You know, what is our origin? Why are we here? That's a clip from a little Skeptico movie project episode kind of experiment that I put together with Bruce Frenton, who you'll hear from today, and Sean Fahey, who was the guy who really did all the work behind it. Although Bruce and Danny did a lot of the work too. Anyways, I am so excited about Bruce's work, and I always have been. And the last interview we did I thought was just terrific. And then I ran into the Snake Brothers, Russ and Kyle Allen of Brothers of the Serpent podcast. And I kind of got them interested in it, and they're interested in doing a series of interviews on this topic. So as kind of a way of launching that little project, I invited everybody here on Skeptico, and here's what we came up with. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome back Bruce Fenton to Skeptico. Bruce is the author of Exogenesis, Hybrid Humans, A Scientific History of Extraterrestrial Genetic Manipulation, and also The Forgotten Exodus, The Into Africa Theory of Human Evolution, with a foreword by Graham Hancock, which is quite impressive, and because I thought Bruce's work was so fantastic, innovative, and important, as you know, if you listen to that first interview that I did with him, he's also featured in this upcoming, uh, not even upcoming, it's out. That's what we're going to talk about today. This extended video slash movie we did called 780,000, Our Alien Origin Story which is available right now. You can go watch it on YouTube for free. It's soon going to be on Amazon as well. If we can ever get it up on that platform, which is, I don't know, they're saying they need more time. So give them all the time they need. And we're also joined today by Russ and Kyle Allen, the creators and hosts of Brothers of the Serpent podcast. Just a very, very cool show. You know, I was on their show recently and I really, really enjoyed the way these guys dig into this. We have kind of a similar perspective on it, although they are much more well-versed in kind of these ancient mysteries kind of things. So I thought it'd be great to have them on along with Bruce and kind of do like a little launch party for this video, 780,000, and for Bruce's excellent book. You know, an opportunity to get on and talk about some stuff. And we were all just having a chat, you know, before, they, before we hit tape rolling, and it was super, there's so many interesting things to get to. So, Bruce, first of all, to you, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. We've talked so many times during the making of this film, and it's been just great working with you. So, thanks Thank for you. coming on. Thanks for having us back on. You know, thanks for working with us on the um, the film production. Yeah, be really cool. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really great. And uh, you know, the, my only regret is mm. Danny, your wife, and your co-researcher on this mm. had such a great contribution. And I think yeah. people could, will get that from reading the book, mm -hmm. and they'll maybe know. And, and I think it also maybe comes in in the interview you did and that we referenced mm -hmm. to it. But uh, she's awesome, and it was just so cool. Uh, getting to know her as well so yeah. we'll talk her into doing some sort of video chat with you or something or you know so that she can give you her overview another time as well that's good i like sneak that in <laughs> that's how we're gonna do it <laughs> hey and then uh russ and kyle i want you guys to hey i don't know if you can see this but i am wearing my uh -huh. hey look at that snake. Yeah. <laughs> my snake t-shirt in honor of you guys and the hat just to trigger anyone who who <laughs> 
could possibly be triggered by the American flag. I didn't have any agenda. I just put a flag <laughs> on my hands, but I know that's still going to trigger people. So you guys, so cool having you here. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Looking yeah. forward to this uh, interview. Yeah, it was a blast having you on our show, Alex, and uh, we're really we're really glad to be here on Skeptico with Bruce. Terrific. Cool so, Bruce, do you want to take it uh, kind of from – Take it from the top, if you will, on you know these two books, what they're about. In for for someone who really doesn't know, is just kind of dropping into this conversation. Kind of a quick overview of what's going on with these two books that you wrote, uh, Exogenesis and this Into Africa book, which I know you wrote a few years ago, but I think is like such a great, uh, important piece of this puzzle as well. And we're we're going to play some clips from seven hundred eighty thousand. It, it will highlight that, but just kind of the overview for the uninitiated. Sure. Just bear in mind that my quick overview sometimes is about 60 hours long on any topic. <laughs> right. True. True. <laughs> but no, I, I'll try and condense it down. But um, yeah, the, the two books do sort of connect, you know, the, the Inter Africa um, book really was part of a project that I got involved with where I, I went to a site out in the jungles in Ecuador the site was rather mysterious, mysterious. It wasn't clear who built it. Um, there were indications based on nearby archaeology that it could relate to the Lagoa Santa people. Now, they are known from sites down in Brazil, notably the Lagoa Santa site, but also a number of other sites uh, across Brazil and, and even in other areas as well, because we know that they have sites going back at least 20, 30, you know, depending on who you ask, perhaps 40, 50,000 years ago. Um, there there have been finds across parts of well central ecuador including like banos de la Agua, banos de agua santa which is near the town nearest to this site that have you know cave sites where they have found remains that appear to be Lagoa santa so we know that for some reason these people had trekked up through the jungles of brazil you know up through the amazon and into ecuador and so there's i believe there's a whole lost story there you know of civilization throughout the jungles. I mean, obviously there's all sorts of legends about lost cities in the Amazon jungle. We know they're not just stories because some of these are getting found um, as well as mound sites and all sorts of other constructions. In fact, we know that the Amazon jungle is essentially seems to be a sort of a market garden that went wild. There's a lot of, there's a lot of trees and plants and they suggest that it was in some respects deliberately planted in parks and then it went kind of wild. Now this, this indicator of the Lagoa Santa led me into the work of the inter Africa work because it turns out these are a kind of Australoid people, or you know, um, they appear to be of morphology of Australian Aboriginals or Papuans. Now, what are these people doing down in South America 20,000, 30,000 years ago? Obviously, that, that is an implicit argument against the prevailing models of how America was first inhabited. So, when you sort of dig deeper into that, you know, you have to kind of explain well, how, how are these people in the Americas so early if we have an out of Africa story with, you know, 55,000 years ago, modern humans first emerging from Eastern Africa, populating Eurasia, eventually reaching Australia and then the Americas. And, and then, conversely, if it turns out that you've got modern humans in the Americas 40,000 years ago and that they're Aboriginal type people, uh, that, that really doesn't fit. Okay, hold on. Let me interject with a clip from the movie. There's very obviously a cultural shift underway, which fits diffusion rather than sudden emergence. And this is precisely what the genetic data is telling us. That a new paper has just come out, in fact, about a week ago, and they have found that the Y chromosomal lineages of all Eurasian people points to a migration out of Southeast Asia and East Asia 55,000 years ago. Where's Africa in that story, right? This is, this is hugely problematic. A 2018 paper looking at um, the, the mtDNA, the mitochondrial lineages, they found that the oldest variants of haplogroups M and N, which are considered foundational to all modern Eurasian people, those turn out to be in Aboriginal Australians right nowhere near the middle east nowhere near where they think that this these new haplogroups are appearing you know in east africa and the middle east so you've now got the female and male lineages seeming to arise somewhere in, in oceania or east asia right okay i'll pause it there we could go on and on i, I love the way you you present this stuff you know in, in we were chatting like all of us were chatting and i i like 
I really like the point that, that Russ made about he appreciated the, the science-y part of it. And I did too, from the first time we talked, you know, it's like, that's the barrier. Those are the shields mm. that are up. It's like, this guy's coming out with mm. some pretty wild sign, sounding stuff. You know, like the whole out mm. of Africa mm. thing is total bunk, you know, and it, all the best science doesn't prove that to me, show that to me. And mm. I really <laughs> kind of lay it out. Okay, I'll prove it to you. Here it goes. Do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Either either one of you guys, Ross or Kyle. Well, I'm unfortunately I'm not as familiar with the with his Out of Africa book. the The one that I've studied the most is the Exogenesis one. So some of this some of this information is newer to me. Uh, but what I was specifically speaking about was. You know, in your in your book, you sort of intertwine the the intuitive information with and then you go digging for the data. Now, I found that a fascinating way to do the research, but it's harder for me to to like, you know, you say, OK, so we have these ideas or this person had this dream or this this other thing. And then you go looking for information and you find it in the scientific data. That was the part that I found fascinating. Uh, so that's that's basically what I was me meaning when I was saying that I, I had a harder problem with the you know, with the intuitive part. But then once yep. you got into the science, I'm like, okay, there we go. So. Fair enough. Uh, Kyle, do you have any thoughts on the out of Africa part of that? Because, you know, in this larger story that we're going to tell in this, in this interview and in this film is the exogenesis is this story of our human origins are traceable by science that Bruce has discovered to 780,000 years ago. And to me, that kind of shifts our focus. It, it's not just like a date. It like totally changes the paradigm that we would be contemplating. Mm -hmm. Even some of the crises that we're going through now, it kind of forces you to shift your focus and say, wow, how does this really fit in? And I think it also, that's why I wanted to start with the out of Africa thing, is we get hung up on Africa and the migration into out of Africa, what, 70,000 years ago or whatever? Bruce is talking about 780,000 years, if we ever let him get to that story. But first, Kyle, do you have any, do you have any uh, thoughts or have you ever looked into the Africa, out of Africa, into Africa? Because Bruce's thing is like, look, if you really are honest about looking at the data, yeah, there's a movement out of Africa. But it's mm -hmm. after a movement into Africa. So these people were escaping right. from an ecological disaster, and they moved into Africa. And then you guys picked up the trail later on when they moved out. And you said, oh, that's it. That's the event. That, and, and then he goes and looks, finds all this archaeological data that predates that. And he goes, well, then obviously that was just the second leg of the journey. So I don't know, Kyle, have you looked into that at all? Or do you have any thoughts? Yeah, just a little bit. I, I think generally there are some obvious problems with it just based on some of the stories that I've followed. But the, the genetic trail is something that's really hard for me to wrap my brain around how they follow this genetic trail. But um, yeah, there's been uh, some pretty recent stories where they're finding stuff in Europe and saying, wait, how is this possible? Our story about the out of Africa, you know, should have like these people or this thing that we're finding shouldn't be here at this time. So yeah, I think there's some, definitely some legitimate questions and uh i'm coming into this uh, this thing cold as far as your work bruce uh but i'm looking forward to reading your books uh, so yeah very interested to hear and also we we have followed pretty closely a lot of the quote-unquote anomalous finds in the americas of much more ancient yeah. peoples like you know we, kyle and i've i think i would say that we focused our study on younger driest period and afterwards in terms of the human origin story, because that's, you know, we're looking, we're looking at this more recent period. So when you take it all the way back to 780,000 years, I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is way more interesting. And there are finds in the Americas that are too old. You know, it's the, the Clovis first model has been destroyed. Basically. I mean, there are some people that are still clinging to it, but yeah, there, there are, there are plenty of finds here that I think, uh, ruin that story for them absolutely so, yeah. yeah so so bruce I mean, let's just wrap up the this uh, into africa mm -hmm. out of africa what are we leaving off here that that people mm -hmm. should uh come to understand through your work that's important to the bigger story you know, one thing i suppose is it, it kind of reminds us that 
you know, if we're talking about where does this story start, again, you have to decide, you know, what is a human, you know, what, what is important to the human story, you know, all, all these kind of concepts, because, you know, if you say, well, where does our, our lineage start? Well, it starts with a single celled organism 4.5 billion years ago, you know, in the ocean somewhere. So, I mean, where do we trace to, where do we start, right, in the human story? So if, if you are taking it just from the genus Homo, then that appears to emerge first in Africa. But then if you trace it back to, you know, earlier hominins, some of those appear to be in the Mediterranean region now. They're finding fossils that suggest perhaps the earliest hominins might have been there. And if you go back to when was the first kind of primates, and stuff, they're tracing these back down to, into East Asia and the jungles there. So uh, there is a degree of where do you want to start the story? Right now, if we're dealing with Homo sapiens, then that's where I say that you know I argue that their story begins 780,000 years ago. So again, so someone can sort of you know you can kind of say, well, where are you starting this? And that's important to where we are looking geographically and and what kind of human we're looking at, right? So it does shift, and I think the um the out of Africa and the the greater evolutionary story kind of informs us of that timeline, that narrative. But then we have to choose from it what is important, and obviously the the newer book really is a focus more on homo sapiens and our yeah. story yeah so that's where we should go I, I i don't want to hold back or like bury the lead here tell us about the shift to mm -hmm. seven hundred and eighty thousand years ago and why you think mm -hmm. that needs to be taken seriously how you originally kind of came to even entertain the idea and then specifically and that's what we really tried to capture in our previous interview on skeptico and in this new release of 780,000 is how you proved it. Cause you went about proving it as in NASA documents, mm -hmm. archeological finds, you know, published mm -hmm. work, you proved it in that way. So yeah. tell us that the big picture there. Yeah. I mean, well, one of the interesting things that happened and it's, again, it's still quite recent, you know, it's funny how sometimes uh, synchronous events flow because until very recently, the last few years, it was understood that Homo sapiens emerged around about 400,000 years ago, something like that, that we split off from Neanderthals and you know, Denisovans. But then they found the oldest DNA ever from any humans, which came from a site in Spain called Cima de los Huesos, the Pit of Bones. And they managed to get a sample of DNA that was about 430,000 years old. And it turned out that that was from an early Neanderthal ancestor. And, and, and really, it was so far along the, the evolutionary route to becoming a Neanderthal, as we'd understand, that it pushed back the split between Neanderthals, us, and Denisovans, all the way back to at least 550 to 750,000 years ago. So it was like a, a massive rewrite. Since then, there's been other studies. There's a, a comparative study of different craniums and jaws, teeth, that pushed it to around 900,000. Uh, and some DNA sampling of Denisovans suggesting 800,000. I mean, some of these days, you're never absolutely precise. They give you a range. But in the middle of these ranges, you keep coming to around this 800,000. And now that ties in nicely with the cranial finds that we already had in the, the record, which showed that around 800,000 years ago. Hold on, because we are sorry. kind of burying the lead on people. And I get mm -hmm. that you can't tell the story and that we're trying to squeeze it down. Mm -hmm. But you started with 780,000. Because yeah, they you were that. you were told you were told. I yes. mean, this information mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. passed to you again, and as Russ said, in a way that we're we're not comfortable with. You know, because sure, it yeah. gets into the metaphysical and the psychic and the stuff like this, and it gets into connection with Altringa objects mm -hmm. that somehow ha have an ability to communicate. All this kind of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I, I think you immediately go to the science stuff. Because we love that. We all love that. We want to hear that you can back it up. But we are kind of bearing the lead because you started with this information yeah. whispered in your ear, if you will, that said it all started 780,000 years yeah. ago. Now you, Bruce, need to go prove that. And you did. Yeah, that's the interesting. Yes, I suppose you could say it's around the other way. So I'm giving you the what's happened since we got that date. The funny thing is science has come in to match it. But you're right that we already had a date that we were looking at. And at the time, when that information, the idea that there was events 780,000 years ago coming to us via uh, an interaction between an individual in Australia named Valerie Barrow and an artifact, which is a, considered to be a highly sacred artifact of the Arente people, 
who language group that is centered around central Australia, Uluru, some of the regions around there, that they have these artifacts which their own law says are embodiments of beings from the first time, the creation time, the Alturinga time, that these are literally living entities in, the, in a form that will persist against time and where, and that they took on those forms in that creation time, and that these carry information down through the ages, and they are usually you know, revered, they're kept in caves, they're kept away from people, they can only be handled by the elders, the what they call clever fellas, basically what we'd think of as shamans, who are the only people who can interact with these because they're so highly sacred, but possibly for other reasons, you know, may even be dangerous. I mean, there's an indication that a lot of people be scared of these, they wouldn't really want to go near them. Now, I suggest that this could be something like a Bracewell probe, which is an extraterrestrial technology, which would be left on a planet. A hypothesized mm -hmm. uh, kind of sci-fi idea that, hey, if you're going to explore space, what you might do is just mm -hmm. shoot these probes out there, have them land, and then come to life and wake up and, you know, echo, mm -hmm. tell me what time it is kind of thing. And that yeah, this is kind of like on. that because it starts mm -hmm. spewing out all this information about what's going to happen in the world and what you need mm -hmm. to do. And, and then it starts working your way into your dreams and into Danny, your wife's dreams and other interactions. And you have this in the in mm -hmm. 780, you know, you tell about where you're almost brought to tears by the fact that what you're finding yeah. is matching what you've had these visions of for so long. So it's again, this blending of the science with this extra extended consciousness yeah. kind of input mm -hmm. that you're getting, which really is, is so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. that was years before in 2002, around 2002 that I'd had an experience doing a sort of a shamanic journey, altered state journey in which I'd experienced myself as being an entity, a tall humanoid entity on a craft coming towards the earth, knowing that there'd been some kind of a, an event in which a lot of other fellow beings had been destroyed, feeling that as though being there, not like, you know, um, a conventional memory, but experiencing it, that you're there, it's you, you're, you know, this is happening now, that you're aware of what's just happened, uh, and all of that. And that lasted probably for a couple of minutes at most. Now, I had no context for it, you know, this is 2002. And then all these years later, sort of in 2013, I first became aware of this, this story, you know, from Valerie Barrow and her book, you know, through her research in Australia. Just to clarify that her work was published in 2003, around the time that I was having that experience, funnily enough. So it may even be the same sort of time that she was writing the book, which is kind of intriguing. Um, and that that meshed up with the information in her book, that there was these beings in craft coming down from this exploded mothership. So a lot of beings had died. Uh, even the clothes I was wearing meshed up to the descriptions in her book. So it was, it was bizarre. Now, you know, you could classically say, you know, past life memories. But at the same time, I'm also aware that, you know, you could explain that in other very strange ways. You know, is there an, uh, an alien technology hacking into people's brains? You know, is there um, a spiritual entity that, you know, telepathically telling people this? You know, you can go down lots of wormholes, but the bottom line is it was a very extraordinary experience, which then linked to information I wouldn't be privy to for another decade or so. And it turns out that beyond that, that there's actual evidence that supports both of these accounts. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary flow of information and events. I've written about questions I want to ask mm -hmm. about exogenesis, but they are kind of, uh, I mean, like, unless somebody's read the book, they will have no idea what we're talking about. So, so maybe, uh, maybe we won't do that on this show, or maybe I can try to get into some of it uh, based on stuff you say, but I think, I don't know, how, Alex, how do you want to handle it? Do we assume that people who are listening to this are familiar with the work? I apologize if it's somewhat disjointed or if it moves us too far in the story, but I'll, I'll play a clip from the 780,000 movie and then we'll hear from Bruce next. Sound okay, guys? Yeah, okay. cool. Now, of course, there's a much bigger story here and credit to Valerie, you know, she details all of that in her book, which people can read. But my interest was in these major events because I felt there was the potential to be signatures in the geological records and in you know, academic papers that I could go away and look for evidence of this. Suddenly, 
I had an understanding of a whole series of synchronous events in my life going back years. Now going all the way back to the events in around 2002 when I'd had this shamanic journey experience where I'd seen you know, an alien craft basically coming in towards the earth. Now, Bruce, maybe you could give folks a high level recap of what you thought you might be able to prove. So, I mean, yeah, from the event that we just, you know, discussed already with what I had happened to me, see that you could say influenced me to take more seriously um, Valerie's accounts in terms of the, what was in her book, which is that there is a craft that comes here, a crystalline craft, which is destroyed in orbit vast, you know, not, not talking like a little tiny flying saucer. This is said to have had 50,000 beings on board, very large craft with smaller craft on board. It's destroyed in orbit. There is just a, well, there's a few that survive. They come down, but they are involved in genetically modifying existing hominins on this planet to sort of upgrade them, if you like. And at five years later, that there is a event involving a multi-directional asteroid impact of this planet that is engineered by extraterrestrials. Now, these were free obviously radical and enormous kind of you know, impactful events in our history, if they were real. So they stood out to me as being potentially provable you know, in ways that most things aren't. You know, someone says that there was a being and he, he did this, he did that. Okay, you're not gonna find the bones, you're not gonna find the evidence of that. You know, if there's something on a big scale, something exploding in orbit, meteorites impacting, you know, uh, modification of the genome, those three things stood out to me as being potentially uh, evidential. So one of the things we talk about a lot in the, in the film is this uh, tektite thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you want to tell people a little bit about the high level and then get into the details of what is a tektite and why it was a real mystery. It was a mystery yeah. in science in general before you even decided to look into this. And then what is, what is the mystery surrounding them? Why is it so important to this story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest, in some respects, the Australite mystery, you know, is deserving of a whole analysis on its own, uh, irrespective of any stories about, uh, you know, visitations and genetic engineering or any of that. Um, because you have there a event which has been known to science for 100 years, not explained away, you know, despite all kinds of teams of you know, geologists and physicists and NASA engineers, all sorts of people have thrown their minds at this because we have something that's happened 780,000 years ago. It's been well dated. We have this creation of this material, this Australite tektite spread all across this vast region from Antarctica up to southern China, you know, this absolutely huge, enormous debris field. Right, which does not mesh with any known previous impact events. I mean, we have impacts of, of, of meteorites and asteroids and stuff throughout history. We don't see this kind of debris field. We also have this mysterious material, which not only is it quite clearly a kind of this glass-like tektite, but in some instances you have it in these button forms where it definitely has traveled through the upper atmosphere and entered into our you know, our atmosphere and had secondary melting on its way down. They actually look kind of like little flying saucers. <laughs> they do, ironically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They do. And it's not even so ironic when you break it down, <laughs> yeah. which you do just beautifully. So again, you know, if you think of a craft design, like a nose cone of a rocket, it's dealing with the aerodynamic forces of entering our atmosphere. So that's why we see this. And so again, if you're looking at spaceships, whether human or extraterrestrial, then there's probably some sense to the fact you see these kind of shapes. Because again, if you're, if you're entering atmospheres, you know, in a conventional sense, that you would have aerodynamic shaping. So Yeah, and there's the, another interesting thing about them is that they, they had a two-stage shaping process. That's right. Uh, that you sort of detail in the book, that like they look, they appear to have started out as spheres, mm -hmm. you know, and, a, and, a, and a, a crystalline sphere can't form uh, on the ground. In the sense that it will, it won't be a sphere. A sphere you know, liquid spheres mm -hmm. form in space in a zero g environment, and then it has a secondary shaping process, which is the reentry part, where the sphere is sort of reshaped into this uh, aerodynamic shape. Mm -hmm. And even you were saying in the book that NASA studied some of these shapes to make their reentry vehicles uh, because they were, they were, yeah. they were set up for the reentry. You know, aff affecting the atmosphere. Yeah, from my understanding, that yeah, they sort of realized these teams that were involved in designing these vehicles, they obviously noticed the similarity 
but this yeah. is kind of, looks like it has that look of having entered the atmosphere. So they were very in, intrigued and very interested. Um, that's how NASA sort of got involved with it. And there's been a, a, a various NASA associated studies of astrolite tektites by different people um, that have basically concluded that, yeah, that it has to have come from a source body that was in orbit, uh, that had, was superheated in some way, you know, reduced to a molten liquid glass, and that that then cools into these spheres, as you said, and that then as these enter, and they have to enter quite slowly at a fairly gentle angle, that they can't, you know, they don't come in fast and hot like we have with meteorites and asteroids, that these have to come in at a fairly gentle angle, and that's why we have this, the time for secondary melting and the running of a liquid glass to the back, forming these shapes. Anything that comes in very, very fast and at a steep angle, what happens instead is you have the evaporation of the surface layers at extraordinary heat from the friction, and that just evaporates off. You don't really get much liquid. That liquidation process can't really happen unless you have a gentle, slow entry. So it, that, and that ties into what you're just mentioning there, Bruce, and I don't mm -hmm. want to gloss over it because there's like a million points here. We can't possibly mm -hmm, cover cool. them all today, folks. But this idea of an orbiting object, which is really yeah. strange because, again, I didn't know this stuff. I learned it from you. But mm -hmm. you can't have an orbiting object that that doesn't fit the profile of a spacecraft i mean nothing else i'm saying that backwards but nothing else mm -hmm. fits that profile of an orbiting object quite as nicely as this large crystalline object that's you're talking about yeah essentially you have to get into extraordinary mathematical odds for the earth to capture any significantly large large body you know it's so unlikely that you know, in many mainstream sources I looked at, they just discount it. You know, others say that, you know, it's just within the realms of possibility. If something came in at exactly the right angle, the right size, you know, there's so many considerations. So essentially, we don't expect this to happen. That we have very small objects, car-sized asteroids and things like that, which do get captured. And respectively, large planets like Jupiter and Saturn, they sometimes capture larger asteroids and comets, temporarily usually, which then fly off. But Earth, it's not expected to happen. So it was quite extraordinary to find that, you know, again, which points to that we have something very unusual just in the fact that a large body is now orbiting the planet. And then it turns out that the content, the silica is too high at around 75, 80 percent. We find that asteroids are limited to about 60 percent, that we don't know of any natural bodies out there that are over 60 percent silica. So when you start putting these kind of factors together, you have this very unlikely object, which is now in orbit you know, at precisely the same time as we have a line of extraordinary events, you know, a magnetic pole reversal, the emergence of Homo sapiens, uh, an asteroid bombardment. It's like, what is going on? You know, once you start factoring that in. And, and just to pull back the lens even further, we're talking about, I mean, a geological event here that is mm -hmm. in a scale that we're looking at millions of years. So like, I mean, mm -hmm. science is looking at millions of years and saying, okay, we've seen these different things fall from the sky, and they're going, wow, but this is the mm -hmm. only time we can see something exactly like this that has ever happened yeah. in this particular place, only once, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it happened at exactly this time that we were looking mm -hmm. for. I mean, I don't think, well, how did that strike you guys in terms of yeah. being extraordinary or being, well, show me more? No, I, I, the, this part about the tectites, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it's the objects seem to be moving too slowly, like he was saying, to be a normal cometary or asteroidal body impact. Those those move really quickly. You know, when they when they impact, when they come into the atmosphere, number one, they don't start out molten. That's <laughs> that's yeah. one one point. Number two, they come in so fast that a lot of times, depending on the angle of impact, they're only in the atmosphere for a couple of seconds before they make landfall. Mm -hmm. What about uh, the fact making landfall? What about the fact that there's no crater? Yeah, because there's no. As, as Bruce points out, you know, later is that anything when you start talking about things this size, and then you go over to uh, uh, Laos, which where we start seeing these bigger objects, and they're huge. You know, they're twenty kilograms, but there's no crater. And Bruce, didn't you say that it, it, that we would estimate the crater to be like dinosaur extinction extinction size thing? Yeah. It was either 40 kilometers or 40 miles across, you know, so like a vast, vast sized, you know, and because it's supposed to be young, it's 780,000 years. Obviously, we can find impact sites from millions and millions of years ago. So this was really problematic. And it's been, you know, a head scratcher for the geologists for 
Well, so it just fits perfectly in. with with your theory, right? It's the yeah, if it's it a spacecraft that was blown up in space, there's no crater. It's all this mm -hmm. little debris that's thrown around. Versus if it's a big rock up there, it comes down and it slams into the slams into the earth. But I'm sorry, guys, I kind of cut it off a little bit short. What else did you think about that and or the crater? Well, I really think the idea is awesome, but my brain immediately goes into trying to figure out how it could not be <laughs> aliens, right? You know, well, that's <laughs> so, right. You should. I'm you should. I, you know, it's just what happens, and I'm imagining. Well, there could have been a scenario where there was an impact, which is extremely unlikely, between two uh, cometary or or you know meteorite or, or meteor objects near the atmosphere at their closest approach to earth to slow them down and also melt them to create your initial molten spheres that then fell slowly into the atmosphere that doesn't necessarily explain the high silica content but it could explain an, a very unlikely scenario of slow entry of pre-molten and then solidified spheres um, that were out in space and then fell down and remelted upon entry. Yeah, and Bruce, the, and the Bruce, hold and let's there would be let's no, see if Bruce, there would be no crater again with again with the idea about capturing a body in space. You know, there's there's always these like infinitesimally small chances of things happening, right? But what we can yeah. look at there is that nobody has none of the scientists who spent the hundred years on this propose that as a possible solution. So right. one would assume that that's because of when you put all the evidence together that would remain problematic. You know, again, apart from the odds of these two objects happening to hit, so if we think about the size of space, and we think about how unlikely it would be for two relatively small objects in space to hit and just happen to hit in the upper, you know, the upper atmosphere of our planet. And then does the distribution pattern fit with that? You know, and as it's, you said, if it's two different bodies, we'd almost expect to have some of the material that would be different would have some of the different components. If you have some of the original body A, body B, that body yeah, A should be a different point. composition to body B. What you find with ospectectite is it's very homogenous that throughout the entire mass of this material that's being found is almost identical in composition throughout. Now that's problematic for any of the, for that scenario, but also for the impact because what you expect in a, in a really fast kind of singular explosion event, that you should pick the impact, that you should have some of the material that is only partly melted or is of different compositions. You know, like if you're impacting some granite and sandstone, that some parts will have more granite, some parts will have more sandstone, some parts are partly melted, some aren't. So again, if you have two objects here, you would expect to be able to detect the presence of two original source bodies. So, so you know, some parts remaining from part A and part B, right? Right. So again, because of the homogeneity of the material, that really points to being just an object superheated not encountering material from other objects, whether the earth, the moon, or another body. So that, that's where it becomes problematic. And, and also, in fact, this homogeneity, especially the lack of bubbles, it turns out there's this whole thing um, called, I think it's Moore's Law or something like, Moses Law or something like that. Basically that if you're creating a glass and you want to remove all the bubbles, you know, like when we're producing glass, that you have to have a kind of sustained event, you know, that you heat the glass for a while, and that refines it down to this homogenous material with very few bubbles. And uh, it's pointed out that, in fact, with, with this glass material, that we have that. And so now this is problematic because in an impact, you have a singular moment of extreme energy, extreme heat, you know, extreme pressure, and that's it. But that's not how we form homogenous glasses. They're, they're energized over time. And now we're told in this original material that this ship is being hit with a sustained energy beam that is superheating it and is essentially melting it and blows it apart and it turns into this homogenous glass. So that's, again, this is a funny factor that's been pointed out by some of the scientists. It shouldn't be homogenous like this if it's a singular, just, you know, impact explosion. We, we shouldn't see this. Right. We should see a lot of bubbles and see a lot of heart melt and things like that. So that, again, there's a lot of science that suggests we have something extraordinary happening. Yeah, or it could have been heated from within the spaceship from whatever energy drive it had well yeah you know, it explodes there's a nuclear explosion at the end but i mean yeah i want it to be a crystal spaceship i'll just tell you straight <laughs> up but no don't want it, it to be don't, don't, no, you don't not, have to no, want not it to be that no i mean like i say if there's a way to explain it another way but i say this is problematic because then you need what can be a sustained energy event that you know uh, other than this because if, if impacts don't explain it what are we left with? You know, solar right. flare or something hitting this? Yeah, I mean, we have to find something, a mechanism that could continually heat this body 
to make this homogenous, nearly bubble-free glass. Yeah, and uh, you know the the other idea, the you know the standard model idea for tektites mm -hmm. is that they're post-explosion, that they're actually supposed to be a mixture of the impactor and ejecta. Exactly. And this, the, the, this part melt in some way. Right, and so the, like you were saying, the, 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 this material doesn't fit that profile because, no. it, like you said, it would be a mixture of all this different stuff, and it's actually too homogenous mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, so, so it is interesting. Extraordinary in that yeah. Extent. And not just the Australite tektite, you know, there are four other strewn fields, and these are problematic. I don't go into them in the book, but keep in mind that the whole history of the planet, there's only yeah. like four of these strewn fields. That's right. Now, what the hell's going on there? Because if these are just from standard impacts, then why why are there not you know hundreds and hundreds of right. these sites with these? So I mean again, you could probably dig dive into the backstory of some of these others. I haven't, but I do suspect that they're all in some way extraordinary. But the reason why we can focus on this one in particular is because it's unique in that we have these tech type buttons that are quite clearly come down from space. So that it's not the same as the other strewn fields. Hey, so Bruce, that that is like I mean we could talk we had just talked so long, and that's why it's really cool. If you guys do have Bruce on for a series of interviews, I think that'd be fantastic because that's really what this topic mm -hmm. deserves, especially for folks like all of us who are interested in the science. And again, the the key part of this story is it has this incredible extended consciousness aspect to it but then what we're trying to do in our humble little minds here is tie it back to this science and i can't let go of this there's four fields four times when we've seen this kind of tektite event and you're talking about just one of them what is the range mm -hmm. of those different ones and you've already explained why this one is unique but i, I guess i want to drive home this point that of all the events we've ever traced on the the history geological history of our planet you know of all the different mm -hmm. craters this is unique yeah i mean some of them go but i mean i think with the moldavite it goes back uh it's certainly in the tens of millions i think if, if not longer there's another strewn field i think an african strewn field which is around a million years old and, and some have suggested that perhaps it's closer to the dating on the australite than that maybe it's within the same frame but I think around about a million years old. So that's the second, you know, second youngest. And then you've got Moldavite and you've got a US um, site as well, which I, I forgot where it's actually. Yeah, it's in Georgia. Another, in Georgia, yeah. You've got yeah a it's, field well, it, it, the, the piece of it that's exposed that we know about is in Georgia, yeah. Hmm. And so that one, I think, is again going back quite early. Geologically. Yeah, that one's really old, I think, yeah. yeah. So it's only these two that are, you know, fairly recent, the um, African and the Australasian. So again, you know, you get the, the, the little echo machine and the Aboriginal Australian people have their ancient echo and it comes out and says, hey, look, guys, it's 780, look for it. Mm -hmm. And boom, you find it right to the date. You don't find it 10 million years ago, 5 million years ago. You find it, boom. And that is unbelievably mm -hmm. needle in a haystack thing. And it's just easy to kind of lose the big picture here. Well, yeah, that and of course, and then we very briefly mentioned, you know, there's a claim that there is a multi-directional asteroid bombardment of the planet five years later. So now in geological terms, you can't pinpoint five years difference. So you'd be looking for an event approximately in the same 10,000, 20,000 years, right? Because yeah. we're not quite at the pinpoint accuracy on these things. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it turned out that in 2016, you know, a team of German geologists had stumbled on evidence of a multi-directional asteroid bombardment. And keep in mind, this book, you know, the source material is published, you know, so it's in the public record from 2003. This impact, multi-directional impact, is discovered in 2016. Now, you can't then say, well, you know, this person's heard about it, you know, they've woven it into a, a sci-fi story. You just can't do that. And it turns out that when, when does this event happen? Approximately the same time as the Australites. So they give it a little bit of leeway each side because it's about three different or four different impact sites they found. And they, they're close enough in their geological dating that they believe they happened at the same time. Now, you've got uh, impacts down in Tasmania, impacts in Central America, and impacts a couple other sites. And they are sure that these basically are you know, interrelated. Yeah, this, yeah. This, is, um, this might be going a little too deep into the story here, but this part bothered me in the story that was being told, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so the, the the ship shows up, it's destroyed. Some people survive. They end up on the ground. They start trying to live there. They, I guess, they sent out a distress call, oh, really? you know. And and then five years later, 
people show up and they and they start bombarding the planet and there are survivors on the planet. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> why would they do that? You know, I mean, I know this is probably not something that can be answered, but this part of the story bothered me. I don't. I wondered why, mm -hmm. when they asked for rescue, that the people show up and then start slamming the planet with asteroids. That you you can't. They don't want rescue. They, that's sort of clarified in the book. They don't want to be rescued. They are offered to be rescued. That's right. This, but this, this is more like a, an enforcement of the original agreement for another group to leave the planet. But there yeah. is a communication between them. So although it's never completely explained, we assume that there is some level of defense of locations where these other survivors are. Because yeah. They, they, you... are in, they are in communication, but they, there's no attempt to go into depth of this is how we, you know, you know, we put them in a particular area. You know, it doesn't really explain it. But yeah. one has to infer that in this communication between them where they say we want to remain, that, you know, they would be protected from this bombardment. Yeah, that they would have to tell them, like, okay, you need to go hide because we're about to start yeah, throwing it to the planet you're we on. We won't hit you here, but we're going to be <laughs> yeah. blowing you out of the planet to bits. That's right. Like I was saying, we've been studying the Younger Dryas period, specifically the impact hypothesis about the Younger Dryas. And a bombardment, even of small material, even the stuff that just explodes in the air that doesn't always make it all the way down to the ground, causes extinction-level events. Yeah. You know, you don't it's have to have it. Yeah, it's cataclysmic for the whole planet. Mm -hmm. so oh, absolutely i mean you know it's theorized that even with um one of the objects that hit in antarctica left it, it's believed it left an initial crater in the ice about 200 miles by 200 miles 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers i'd have Oof. to check but uh, you think about it, they think that that was an object on the same scale as the one that eradicated the dinosaurs yeah and that's, that's... not a small impact no. right and that's just one of them and, and you know, there, there's several that are impacting. And it, it was theorized that the only reason why that didn't cause the same level of extinction event is because it was in ice and because the world was in an ice age at that time. So there was a lot of sea ice and that absorbed a lot of the energy. And so now if these impacts were happening you know, at a, a point when there wasn't so much ice, you know, like now, that we would have had an event like the dinosaur extinction event. But it still was severe. I mean, they, they think that these yeah. multi-directional impacts caused firestorms, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, I mean, so by no stretch was it, you know, like, you know, cakewalk. It would have been, right. yeah, there would have been mass extinction type events, you know, in, in some areas, definitely. I would just like to make a comment about the story and its similarities to some translations and interpretations of the Sumerian text of the Anunnaki coming down um, in key, genetically alternate, alter, altering the mm -hmm. hominids that lived on the planet to make the Adamu. And then you have... Another story that comes much later, which is the, the quote-unquote fallen, which are like Shimyaza and the 200 fallen angels that come down, take the daughters of men to be their wives, and then they don't want to leave, but it was against the compact with, with the gods or God. And so then there's like a, a battle ensues between them where, he, where God destroys all of them. Mm -hmm. That's just really interesting yeah, to me. So. There are similarities for sure. Across. There are, and you know, you find them elsewhere as well. I mean, you say there's some elements of this in the Bible stories, again, which relates to the Sumerian stories anyway. But um, yes. now this is, this is problematic if you take it from a very mundane materialist conventional view, particularly if you take a view that there's not been contact events with other extraterrestrials over time. Otherwise, it's quite easily explainable why we have similarities in these different stories. Because if either of one of two or both of these other scenarios are true, then it's explainable. One being the very common claim that many people particularly shamans, mediums, whatnot, can have psychical communication with non-human extraterrestrials, you know, that have this information and it keeps being perpetually renewed, right? Then immediately you can see how this stuff perpetuates through time and space. The second one being, of course, direct contact, which again, vast numbers of people, you know, whole civilizations claim that they've been in contact, whether, you know, Native Americans, you know, Aboriginal people, all sorts of people said, we've had ongoing contact. They tell us history. They tell us stuff. You know, we can, some of them say, we go and sit in the bush, meditate get contact with the the star people and they tell us stuff right so in either of those scenarios there's no problem of course if you go from a totally materialist view that people can't do that then you're stuck scratching your head how can the sumerians know this story from 780,000 years ago? how could they have any indication about modification of human beings you know why is that story so persistent why is it the native americans are talking about that we have ancestry to the pleiades where's this coming from now even if it's even a real event 780,000 years is too long for this to be oral history, right? It's too long. Okay. It's, not, it's yeah. not believable that you can pass down an accurate story for 780,000 years, particularly right. 
when those first generation don't have the complex brain that we have. There's no reason to think that they were capable of really doing that, right? Having that whole story and conveying it. So the yeah. only way you can have this is either someone is tapping into this information in some kind of psychical way, or there's a direct contact. There's a landing, there's a refreshing of the story through that. Which now, is either of what, those. Sorry. That's basically what the Sumerians were claiming is that the Anunnaki came down and told they them all this. Contact. So exactly, I mean, they had contact. Same you as the Mayans have the stories order. of direct contact. All sorts of cultures have stories. If you accept the very many stories of direct contact or psychical interaction, either of those explain that straight away. Why are we hearing a similar story? That the Sumerian story seems almost like a, almost like a the slightly Chinese whispers version of what I'm providing in my book. That they, it's not that, quite what, right. It's probably written down after the events, right? That's so, what I keep hearing in, in all this is, you know, the, the whisper to your neighbor, the telephone game, you know. But, but I tell you what, guys, we're, we're running out of time. And really, I think one of the purposes of this show was to kind of make this introduction because I'm really, really hopeful that you guys will do this series. And you can already see, I mean, I think the audience can already see that the brothers, the snakes, they ain't gonna lay on, they ain't gonna roll over. Not that snakes roll over. I don't know how snakes do that, but they're not gonna roll over on this. They're gonna dig into it and they're gonna try and pull it apart. And if anyone remembers the first interview that I did, that's how I framed it up because that's really what I do, you know. I was like, no, I I'm pulling this guy down. I'm pulling this guy's friend, he's going down. And I tried the best I could. So this is like a passing of the baton to people who are more capable, pull it apart tell us where it's wrong but i tell you what i'm gonna do because we got like five minutes and bruce has to run so want to leave people with something too so go ahead but i have a few things to say won't take me a minute though mm -hmm. okay no uh do you want to do it before or after this clip i have well, i have one thing i would say if you're going to throw out if you're going to be a materialist and if you're going to throw out the possibility of contact then you're not going to solve yeah any mysteries about the our origins so that's my opinion mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. go ahead and play the clip alex i'll do this after after that's over having validated that there was not only a large crystalline object in orbit just as this information had stated and having found that there was indeed a multi-directional asteroid bombardment as the information had stated i now was in a position where i had to look at perhaps the most controversial and most important claim in this information, which is of course that Homo sapiens are tied to this story. That this, these beings, this intelligence, you know, goes on to make a modification in the early hominins that are living on the planet at this time. Okay, so we might end that right there. And there's so much obviously that we could talk about in terms of the genetic modification. And it's incredible. Uh, I think people already get a sense for the, the depth that Bruce goes into in his research. And I guarantee you he's done that with the genetic information too. Not that you would uh, believe it or have to believe it. No. But uh, let me, as we wrap it up, let me, let me toss it over to you, Russ, and, and tell me what you're thinking. Okay, so going through the book, I was really... I, I, two things happened to me in the Gosford Glyphs part. One, I was sort of confused by uh, what was happening there. Obviously, there was there was some stuff. You know, you guys go there, and then you there's a lot of uh, visions and intuitive that's stuff that's happening, right? Which was all interesting. The other thing that was really fascinating to me is that I've I've looked into this a lot. I don't know if you're familiar with Ben from Uncharted X. Uh, he's done a lot of work on this. Uh, he's gone there multiple times. He is Australian, but he, he lives in California, but he's been there. Uh, he has a whole video on it. There's a couple of guys, one of them's named Yusuf. Uh, they're Egyptians and they have taken, oh, yeah, they've taken these glyphs and they've done, they, they've got a whole series of videos on their YouTube channel and they've published a paper about their translations. <laughs> So what was interesting to me, the, 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 the part that was strange was they're looking at the glyph types and saying, well, these look to be from this particular late period of Egypt. But the story they are translating from those glyphs, I got, I got a couple of the lines here from their translations. Here's one of them. The ships capsized. They turned over and were destroyed into pieces. We prayed to our gods for help, but many were killed. 
God will keep the hidden burial from being reached and give the foreign land heritage and eternal life to the deceased will be given power in this place. They Crazy. are so close to the story that you're telling. It's very fascinating. So on the one hand, I'm like, okay, they're dating it to this very late period of Egypt. But on the other hand, the story sounds so close to the one that you're telling in your book. And so I, I, we're, I definitely want to dig it into that more on our show. I, when we come I, on. I'm so, so Bruce, you know, we're going to give you the last word here. Tell people, you know, what's going on with the book. Uh, where they can find it. I know you're doing a lot of really terrific media appearances as well, and you're continuing to do this research. So tell us in a couple minutes kind of what continues to go on with this work. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if, if people would like to you know, interact with me, I'm on Twitter quite a lot. You know, I try to be available to ask questions or queries. You know, people if they've read the book and they've got some feedback, you know, uh, if they get me on basically Exogenesis HH, my handle there. Um, yeah, I'm doing lots of interviews. So people, if they sort of keep an eye on me, Facebook or on there, I'll share some of those links. Um, I might do a kind of follow-up book. We'll see. So I am, you know, looking to see, you know, additional information to this. Of course, if they watch the um, the free documentary on YouTube, it'd be great because they'll get a good overview, you know, from what we've done. Um, but yeah, otherwise the book is available at in the US. It's available now. You know, bookstores. I understand you can order it. I see Amazon, Barnes and Noble. In Europe, the print version will be out I think, on the 26th of July due to, you know, coronavirus slowing down, shipping and all that kind of stuff. But it's available, you know, audio, Kindle, all the other you know, alleyways, but just not print in Europe at the moment. Great. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to wrap it up there. And I, I hope, you know, we, we kind of touched on some stuff like we said all along. It's a huge topic, so we can't get mm -hmm. into it too much. But hopefully we've we've maybe made some people interested that didn't know about it before. And it's kind of fun to see you guys coming into it, you know, fresh and clean and some of the, your perspective. So thanks guys. And uh, we'll stay on top of this. Bruce, Russ, Kyle, thank you all so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Bruce and Russ and Kyle for joining me today on Skeptico. The question I guess I'd have to tee up from this interview has to do with the whole premise of the movie. Do you buy it? 780,000 years ago begins the human origin story. That's an unbelievably big claim. What would it take to nudge you closer to some acceptance of that? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Jump on over to the Skeptical Forum or just drop me a note. I have some really interesting chats coming up more on the evil stuff of course but not just on that so I, I hope you stay with me for all of that i hope you're enjoying this and i hope you can find some value in it until next time take care and bye for now mm -hmm.